Hey there students! Welcome to the second part of my lecture on reform in Britain from 1815 to 1848. In the first part, I looked at the Reform Act of 1832 which expanded the franchise to where instead of one out of twelve adult men could vote, one out of six adult men could vote. And in this segment, I'm going to be focusing on the Chartist. Quick shout out to Miss Mossbacker's class in Atlanta, Georgia at Cobb County Christian. Thank you all so much for supporting my work. Hope to see y'all sometime. So we're going to look now at the Chartist and we need to keep in mind that this Reform Act of 1832, while it expanded suffrage, it did not create democracy. Now keep in mind at this time democracy wasn't really a goal because you have conservatives and liberals who made a deal to create the Reform Act of 1832 and both of these groups are concerned about the protection of property. And in the Reform Act of 1832 it lowered property requirements and altered things so you didn't necessarily have to own land, but there was still no suffrage for the working class because if these people can vote, they're not really going to be worried about the protection of property. Now, the working class, they feel differently. They feel like, well, you know what, I'm a citizen of this country, I should be able to vote too. And one of the most vocal working class movements in the early 19th century in England was the movement of the Chartists. All right, so the Chartists, who were they? All right, now first of all, they're working class agitators and conservative leaders resisted working class agitation in the very early part of the 19th century. The Peterloo Massacre in 1819, kind of named after the Battle of Waterloo, this was a working class protest and the government decided, well, you know what? We know how to get rid of this. Let's call in the cavalry. Now, literally, not figuratively, all right? So literally, a cavalry charge into a working class protest, killing 15 and injuring horses injuring hundreds, not horses. There might have been some horses injured. I mean, I guess if you put a horse like into a hostile crowd, maybe. So, you know, but yeah, so hundreds, horses, a lot of people got injured and 15 people got killed here. So at first, the government is very hostile to these working class movements. And what happens here is in the 1830s, you see that the People's Charter starts to gain traction. And the whole idea of the People's Charter was something to make the government more accountable to the common people of Britain. So the Chartists are operating largely between 1838 and 1850, and these are working class activists who supported the People's Charter. Now, Chartism was defined by six points. The six points of Chartism are, first of all, universal male suffrage, that every man over 21 should be able to vote. Second, equal size electoral districts, so you shouldn't have one district here that has a certain amount of people and another district there that has less people or more people. Voting by secret ballot is the third point. Fourth, no property qualification for members of parliament that anybody should be eligible to run for parliament. Five, pay for members of parliament. Keep in mind that what you're dealing with here is that before this, parliament wasn't paid. And not only do you have these property requirements that say, well, you must be this rich to enter or something like that, but also since it was a job and it didn't pay anything, you had to be wealthy to serve in parliament. And then finally, six annual elections of parliament, which all of the, you know, to make the parliament more accountable to the people. Really, what they're wanting here is direct democracy. Now, of course, in the United States and even in, uh, in the UK today and in pretty much any westernized country, all of this stuff here is pretty much a given. Like, this stuff is not really radical, and if you think about it, it's uh, really just in America in the 1830s, this stuff was already the case. You already had universal male suffrage and pay for members of Congress and equal-sized districts and all of that stuff. So, what they want is democratic reform. They want more democracy. Now, keep in mind that the entrenched classes, whether liberal or conservative, they, they are scared of democracy. And for good reason, because the working class isn't really concerned about the protection of property like the liberals and the conservatives are.
So as far as these six points of chartism, this is a huge petition movement that is gathering in England at this time. And in 1839, the People's Charter got 1.3 million signatures. So I kind of almost feel like Dr. Evil or something. 1.3 million signatures. Uh, I don't have my Mr. Bigglesworth with me, but or I'd, uh, or I'd pet that little cat. But the House of Commons did not accept the petition. All right, the House of Commons, like, psh, no, we got like, you know, maybe they found a uh, bend over on there and they were like, nope, throwing the whole thing out. All right, that we don't even want to hear it. And so from 1838 to 1848, uh, these uh, chartists start to demonstrate. And sometimes these demonstrations turn violent. You can see here a political cartoon, an etching or something like that, where you see chartists who are coming to blows with the police. Now, there was a Chartist mural in Newport until 2013 when the building was torn down, but luckily somebody took a really cool panoramic photo of it that I'm about to show to you now. So this is going to go over the six demands of the Chartist. First of all, the secret ballot. Now, of course, you see the Chartist marching with pikes and maybe a pitchfork there of some sort, um, some sort of uh, halberd or something like that, axe. Uh, you know, these guys look pretty scary. But the secret ballot... A vote for all men over 21. All right, look at all those weapons there. A wage for members of parliament. 300 constituencies of equal numbers of electors. Elections to parliament every year. Now you see here a clash between the military and the Chartists. So again, some of these demonstrations turned violent. And then finally, abolish property ownership qualifications for members of parliament. And once again, a violent demonstration here. And so in 1848, there was a great Chartist meeting. Now, of course, keep in mind that this is in 1848 where... Everything is running amok on the continent in France and Italy, in the German states and all of those places. Keep in mind I've got a series on the revolutions of 1848 that you might want to check out. But in England, what you have here instead of a revolution is you have a meeting, which is a large peaceful demonstration. And so you see here that the Chartists have kind of learned their lesson, as you can see in this advertisement, peace and order is our motto. So to the working men of London, fellow men, the press having misrepresented and vilified us and our intentions, the demonstration committee therefore consider it to be their duty to state that the grievances of us, the working class, are deep and our demands just. We and our families are pining in misery, want, and starvation. We demand a fair day's wages for a fair day's work. We are the slaves of capital. We demand protection to our labor. We are political serfs. We demand to be free. We therefore invite all well-disposed to join our peaceful procession on Monday next April 10th as it is for the good of all that we seek to remove the evils under which we groan. Great propaganda tactic. If you are advocating on behalf of yourself, say that you're doing it for everybody, okay? We're, we're doing this on behalf of all, not just our group. And you can see here there's some language that may be a little bit scary. You can kind of see some uh, sort of Marxist, like working class movement kind of language here. And so you can see why the entrenched classes would be a bit scared of the Chartists. It's like, what do these people want? And if these people get a say in the government, then what kind of laws are they going to advocate for? So, you know, pe people have some valid concerns. But this meeting was very large and the attendance estimates, the Chartists said they had over 300,000 people there. The government said, nah, that was only about 15,000. The Sunday Observer, a newspaper, said there were about 50,000. Now, when we look at point of view analysis, and that's the whole point of thinking about uh, point of view skills, POV, is when we think about, well, the Chartists, they're going to want to exaggerate their numbers. So we probably shouldn't trust that. The government they want the numbers to be as small as possible because they don't want to see that there was a big demonstration. And then the newspaper, their motive would more than likely be, well, they report the news. And also, their number happens to be in the middle. So if we were to estimate for ourselves, okay, about how many people were at this great Chartist meeting, we might say around 50,000. So, you know, this is a great chance to exercise POV analysis for those of you taking AP classes and you've got, you know, a DBQ or something like that. 
So just to review, let's go over the six points of Chartism one more time. 1. Universal male suffrage. 2. Equal sized electoral districts. 3. Voting by secret ballot. 4. No property qualification. 5. Pay for members of parliament. And 6. Annual elections of parliament. Now keep in mind that 1 through 5 have happened and 6 has not happened and it's probably good because at some point when you elect people they need to be able to govern and they don't need to make every single decision on which way the wind is blowing or something like that. So keep in mind that the Chartists in the short term their demands were not acted upon but in the long term everything but annual elections eventually took effect. And another thing to keep in mind is the reason why there's not a big revolution in 1848 in England is because while Parliament did not necessarily act on the Chartist petition, they did see that they would have to do some things. So in lieu of acting upon the Chartist petition, Parliament passed three laws during this time that were helpful in quelling the popular agitation. First of all, the Mines Act in 1842 which I believe kept uh, like women and children out of the mines. Second, in 1846 the Corn Laws were repealed. This is something I'm going to get into in detail in the next segment. And then three, the Ten Hour Act in 1847, which said that uh, women and children could only work 10 hours a day. All right, yeah, men, you know, sorry, but, uh, you know, at least women and children have some protection that they can work no more than 10 hours a day, and that cuts out some of the most abusive labor practices that existed at that time. And, of course, uh, Frederick Engels, the Marxist, the guy that wrote the Communist Manifesto with Karl Marx, um, he's disappointed in this because he's seeing this movement die down. And what he wrote, wrote here is, in order to divert you from the People's Charter, the only goal important to you, they spawn all sorts of projects for superficial reforms. So what's happened here is that Marx and Engels said that there was going to be like this huge violent revolution in England and instead it doesn't happen because when it comes down to it, a violent revolution isn't necessarily what the working class wants. They want a government that just doesn't ignore them and that's what uh, they end up getting. So reform from above is what's going to happen in the early 19th century in Britain rather than radical agitation. So when the upper classes voluntarily reform, then the lower classes will keep quiet because really when it comes down to it, who really wants a violent revolution? So in the next segment, I'm going to look at the Corn Laws. Go ahead and proceed there, and that's going to wrap up my three-part series on reform in Britain in the early 19th century. See you in a bit. <laughs>